uh, like to call the meeting to order. First, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, by recognizing the homeland of the 31st Nation communities uh, of this area, we now call the Fraser Valley Regional District, where we live, work, and learn. Um, the important decisions that we make at a local government level can affect First Nation communities and Indigenous peoples and organizations in a great many ways, both today and in the future. So as part of our collective uh, responsibility, I commit, we continually examine to the work that we do to gut, ensure that our uh, project plans, initiatives and discussions are guided by the principles of inclusion, collaboration and reconciliation. And with that said, I'd like to call our uh, April 13th Regional and Corporate Services Committee to order. First item. Looking for approval of the agenda, addenda, and late items. Moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It's moved by Director Fascio, second by Director Pranger. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 4.1 is a presentation by Jason Hawkins on reusable food packaging pilot project. All right, Jason. Okay, great. Well, uh, good morning and thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to, I will say, come back home to Chilliwack. I had the opportunity to live here for all of one day, 2013. Uh, had a built family with the Chilliwack Chiefs before I got cut after the second exhibition game. So um, uh, it's nice to be here again. Uh, so my name's yeah, Jason. I'm one of two co-founders uh, of reusables.com. We're a uh, Vancouver started company in uh, the circular economy. Uh, we've been around for a couple of years. Um, really excited to present a proposed project that we have here uh, for the Fraser Valley Regional District, starting with a pilot in Chilliwack. Um, so what I'll do today is just spend about 10 minutes or so presenting. I welcome anybody to raise questions throughout the presentation or we can wait until the end. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the business, uh, what the proposed partnership looks like uh, here for FR, uh, FAR, FERD, and then yeah, we can move to some Q&A. Uh, I'm sure this problem doesn't come as a surprise to anyone. Uh, Single-use plastics have um, somewhat exploded in the last 10 years, especially during COVID. Um, the, the, uh, the magnitude of it may come as a surprise to you. And what we often find ourselves doing is asking, you know, asking really, how do we get ourselves into this, this mess? Um, the, the challenge that is really what we're facing is that recycling infrastructure is only part of the solution to single-use plastic waste. Uh, definitely, we need more recycling infrastructure. Um, however, there are other solutions for composting circular economy that can provide a, a, a more um, you know, wholesome solution to this. So that's where we look at the problem. Uh, my background has been in uh, food technology for the last five years. I spent about four years working in grocery. Um, working with a company called spud.ca uh, and really spoke to a lot of grocery retailers around the world that knew this was coming, knew this was a priority. And I think, you know, recently the more the federal legislation, what's come forth uh, has you know, only, only furthered the mandate. Um, so here's some examples federally uh, and then internationally as well in terms of what's happening and bans that are coming on single-use plastics and restrictions um, in terms of how we manage our waste. So, uh, like I said, we started a couple of years ago, and we've been able to capture the interest of a number of communities. So currently, we operate primarily in British Columbia, uh, but also in Seattle, and we're expanding into other communities in BC. Um, we're working in, in our partnership with Clean BC. Uh, we have a mandate to increase the number of stores that are participating on our platform to 500 by the beginning of next year. That includes remote communities in British Columbia as well. So uh, we're not just a Vancouver company, if you will. So uh, really excited to talk more about that expansion plan. Um, our team here, uh, folks that have experience in, you know, consumer behavior, um, understanding technology, how you apply it to a, pro a big problem like single use plastics, and then try and find ways for businesses to adopt it in an easy and convenient way. So what is it? Uh, we make reuse very easy for people. We try to make it as convenient as single use. So, you know, the experience where you get your Starbucks cup, you drink your coffee and you drop it in the closest bin. That's kind of what we're aiming for, what our vision is. So the experience we offer is what we call a tap to reuse experience for the consumer. They can go to any participating store where we provide reusable packaging, stainless steel cups, takeout containers, 
and people can easily just borrow a cup for free and then return it to any participating store. The idea is it's a library type system, so there's no deposit up front. Um, all they have to do really is just you know make the promise with um, a credit card behind as collateral to say, I will return this within two weeks. If I don't, I'm going to get charged five bucks for it. But if I just forgot, I can return it at any time after that and get my money back. So really, we're trying to eliminate all the barriers up front for people to be able to participate in uh, in this circular economy. Um, some more visuals about how that would work with you know takeaway containers. We work with a lot of businesses currently um, over a hundred, uh, you know, including takeout packaging for salads, for you know, for sushi, for burritos, all the stuff that ends up in our landfill. Right now, we're trying to actually divert up chain uh, through reuse. So here's, here's an example of how it works operationally. Um, what we do is we try to partner with the local communities that we work with. Um, we're really not interested in, you know, transporting containers between, you know, large distances between Vancouver and Chilliwack to try and clean them, right? Obviously, we want to be mindful of the environmental impact of, you know, the cleaning activities, the distribution, driving these things around. So what we do is we partner with the local businesses where customers can request those reusables. Those stores pack their food into the reusables upon the request of the customer. And then food is picked up or delivered even by you know, a delivery driver um, or by the customer coming in person for a takeout order. Then we're actually collecting that with partners. So we go to the stores, we collect it. And then in some cases, we're washing it centrally in the community or restaurants who have dishwashing capacity can wash themselves and they can save money on the packaging through that means, right? Um, and then finally, there's a redistribution activity to ensure that the, the stores have the packaging that they need to service the, the customers that they're offering to. Some more visuals on what this experience looks like in Seattle right now. So as you can see, it's kind of a tap to borrow a cup for free. And then you can get that cup and return it to one of our smart bins. It only allows our cups to be returned to it. So, you know, no trash can be put in it. And it's, um, you know, it makes it easy for people to understand that this is something different than recycling or composting or, 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 or garbage. And we have a lot of different types of containers. So we're working with cafes, restaurants, and grocery stores. So we're constantly trying to figure out what different types of packaging can we divert. Uh, we work with the delis, we work with, you know, takeout counters, cafes, as I mentioned, and we're trying to understand even upstream, can we work with consumer packaged goods companies to, you know, help to divert other types of packaging in the grocery store. Now, it, you know, what is the value here for a community? Well, really what we can do is since we're tracking every single use, we're able to feed back valuable environmental data in terms of what plastic or single use packaging waste was diverted, and then what CO2 emissions were avoided. So what we've understood is, you know, if we're able to invest in a durable container that we can reuse hundreds of times over the course of that life, we're able to offset carbon emissions as well, right? Rather than just continuing to reproduce single use packaging, which, you know, costs significant amount of emissions. If we can get a return on our investment in a durable container, we're able to not only have an impact from a waste management perspective, but also a carbon emissions perspective as well. Another example here, which may be of interest for the Fraser Valley Regional District, is how we work with um, you know, institutions like university campuses or offices or buildings where there's dining halls and cafeterias. This is an example here with Simon Fraser University, where we were able to get 100% return rate of the containers, where we're using thousands of reusable packaging every single day with students. They can easily board, return, it's in a closed loop environment, and then we can make the service you know, very seamless for the, the operators to participate in. And there's some numbers to kind of back up what the impact was for SFU, you know, in terms of cost savings on the packaging itself, the return rate, and just the uptake and the participation from the student community. Another example is a film production. So we recently did a project with Disney in Vancouver, where they were doing a six month film product project where we had, you know, upwards of 450 people on set eating off a catering truck every day where they normally would be using single use packaging that goes to landfill. Here we're able to completely eliminate that and offer a zero waste packaging solution that helped them to save a significant amount of waste, not to mention money on the packaging and waste management itself. So what's the bottom line for businesses? Of course, really we're here to service them. They're the heroes in this story. They're busy, they're transitioning. COVID has been a tough time for them. What we're trying to allow them to do is be sustainable, save money, 
get new customers and then enhance their brand experience. In terms of how much it costs, um, there's a bit of text on this slide, but breaking it down, it's really, there's two options for the businesses. They can either clean themselves. Currently about 85% of our stores clean themselves. And then there's a reduced rate for them to be able to participate. That $95 per month gets them unlimited reusable packaging. And then there's opportunities for pilot subsidization, which could bring it down to $75 per month. If they want full service cleaning, there's a slight increase in the cost. For the consumer, the basic, pro, pro, uh, basic process and the basic transaction is free. They don't have to pay anything. If they want to become a power user, they can join our impact membership for $5 monthly. $1 gets donated to Surfrider to help collect single-use plastics from shorelines in Canada, and they can return uh, with a longer period of time, up to 30 days. So this is a summary of the proposed uh, project that we have here with the Fraser Valley Regional District, and we look forward to hearing feedback on it. Um, in, in, in summary, what is it? It's a reasonable packaging solution for up to 50 stores. However, we'll look to do a reduced pilot uh, scope of 25 stores initially. And it's un unlimited in, term in terms of the citizens that can participate. We provide the full solution in terms of the technology, the packaging, and the cleaning solution locally. Um, and then also the reporting and waste management, uh, or excuse me, the reporting on the data and waste diversion and CO2 emissions. We look at the return on investment. We're looking at uh, a lower waste management cost in the community at scale, but more importantly, trying to prove the concept locally that a circular economy can thrive in, you know, in a community like Chilliwack. The scope would be a 12 month pilot, 25 stores with restaurants, cafes, and grocery stores participating. And the cost would be $20,000 for FBRD and Chilliwack to participate, while the businesses and, con and consumers who want to participate would help to cover some of the operational costs as well. So, with that, I'll, I'll close my presentation and uh, welcome any questions. I'll keep the slides up in case we want to flick back to some of them. But again, thanks a lot for having me and listening. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it and uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, Director Fascio, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, thank you for the presentation. Very, very useful. Um, you say that you're going to be starting off in Chilliwack and, and moving through the valley with a presentation. I've seen with the summer coming on, and you know, we are a resort community in Harrison Hot Springs and um, and also our neighbors to the south in Agassiz yeah. um, have certain takeout places as well. So I believe it's an important uh, issue to, for you to get either through the Chamber of Commerce mm. or speak to the uh, restaurants and the hotels. They do uh, takeout as well mm -hmm. uh, in regards to the reusable and keeping the, um, the stuff out of the, um, out of the land, landfill. So um, I'm just putting that forward to you. If it's in, not in your plan, I think you should you should add it to your plan to uh, move to our smaller communities to um, get a, get a, to for them to buy into this uh, mm -hmm. great idea. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that, Director Horn. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of questions for you, and then I see it's on the agenda as an item later on that I'll, I'll hold for staff. But um, I just uh, struggle a little bit to understand some parts of the model, and I was hoping today to see them. So uh, can you just sort of walk us through what it looks like if I walk into a fast food uh, outlet that is a subscriber to the program or participating? Am I going to see or be able to ask for a reusable container there, or do I have to acquire them someplace else, carry them with me in my car and have them when I go into a destination? That's part one I wonder about. And then the other thing I've wondered about is, does this in any way fit into um, reducing waste out of drive throughs I think there, that particular approach to food distribution is very impactful because obviously yeah. people are emitting carbon at the same time as they're consuming things in disposable containers. Um, so I'll, I'll, those are the two questions I have about your model. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so to your to your first uh, question, that the, the model is that we we provide packaging to the businesses, so you don't have to bring your own container. The, the convenience in the model is that you show up, it's the same behavior. You purchase your food and then you just happen to get it in a reusable container. 
And, and then the idea is that we want to add more return locations, which means every store is a return location. And perhaps transit locations, office buildings, apartment buildings can become return locations as well, right? So the idea is to try and add more stores in the network, add more nodes to the network to make it more convenient for people to borrow and return. Um, to, uh, uh, to, to the second question, I think it probably covers part of the first question as well as it relates to fast food, the QSR. So you can think of like the top tier, you know, the McDonald's, the Tim Hortons, the Starbucks, a lot of those drive through um, you know, types of venues create a lot of waste. The, the challenge that, I, that we have with those is that they, um, the, the, the sales cycle is different, obviously. Uh, usually it's a franchise and it's highly standardized. Typically, these large QSR chains want to do their own thing and they don't really like to participate in um, uh, like a, a non-competitive sharing of inventory, right? So, you know, for example, this is one of our, our cups. It's a, you know, as you can see, it's unbranded. It doesn't have any of the local brands on it. And they're fine with that. Most packaging is unbranded. However, if you look at a Starbucks cup or a Tim Hortons cup, or it's, they're all going to be branded, right? So we're open to working with them. Um, I would say that we, we haven't yet found an angle to be able to have them participate. Uh, but we're, you know, we continue to be open to that for now. So for now, it would likely be that they have their own proprietary program, such as the one that Tim Hortons is running in Vancouver. So the follow-up, if I could, is just essentially the, through the piloting project, you're trying to basically create a bit more consumer demand and have some of that consumer demand land with some of the other larger chains, larger food distribution uh, companies. Is that a safe assumption? Um, um, I, I think I think really we're trying to focus on the kind of tier two, tier three, and localized venues for the most part. Uh, the, the tier one QSR chains isn't, isn't a focus for this pilot. Director Ross. Oh, sorry. There's... Took me a while to get that unmuted. Um, yeah, I think this is a fantastic idea. I think as a society, we're far too focused on letting ourselves off the hook by saying we can consume all we want and we'll just, you know, throw it in the recycle bin. But we keep forgetting about the first step, which should be uh, reducing and reusing in the first place. Um, and, and I think most, well, I don't know about most, but a lot of people do want to do the right thing. And I think we need to help them with those kinds of options to make it easy for them. And I just want to applaud the city of Chilliwack for supporting this. And I look forward to its success and expanding throughout the Fraser Valley. Thank you. Other uh, questions from uh, directors? Uh, Director Adamo. Uh, through the chair to Jason, thanks very much. Great presentation. Couple of questions, please. Uh, one of which is, is there an option to not do it by a credit card for your deposit through PayPal or iPhone or any of that type of thing? I'm thinking about the younger generation that is, that's all they use and they don't carry credit cards and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's question one. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the the experience is there's multiple ways to, to borrow a reusable, but I just want to make sure I, uh, my point was clear is there's no deposit upfront. So you don't actually have to pay anything more upfront. Um, it's kind of like a library system. I always okay. try to refer to that in that like, you only pay for it if you don't return the thing. Um, and then even then, if you just forgot, you can still get your money back later. So the ways that you can actually borrow it, it can be a, you know, a tap your card to borrow. It can be um, you download the app and you show your reuser ID or your kind of membership QR code. Um, you know, you can even have a membership card, you know, for example, for certain senior citizens who would prefer to just have a physical card, that's also an option as well. Um, so there's, there's multiple ways we, we try to make it as accessible as possible while, you know, trying to eliminate those barriers to, to reuse many of which include like the deposit, having to, you know, download something on the spot when you're in a big line and it's busy and you're just hungry, uh, just trying to make it as, as fluid as possible while still recognizing that. People have different preferences for how they want to uh, transact. Uh, thanks. And my follow-up, if I may, uh, what's the marketing plan or the education component to get the information out there regarding this within this small trial area? Right. Yeah, it's a good good question. I, I think the first part of the, the strategy is to focus on like the local community messaging. So we'd work with local media 
I believe there's already an article that was uh, published this morning. Um, we find that to be an effective way to get the broader word out. And then we do a lot of messaging and signage in the participating stores that are there. So you can think of like window signs, counter signs, tabletops, uh, that type of stuff that's in person is effective. Um, and then additionally, we do a social media push uh, for people who are interested in following us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, that kind of thing as well. We would start there. Um, and then you know, as the pilot grows, we can look at more traditional media as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Director Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I think it's a great idea. I have two questions, if I may. First one is, um, are, are you planning any education for the high schools? Because uh, oddly enough, there seems to be a Tim Hortons beside every high school, it seems. And when the lunch bell goes, uh, Tim Hortons is packed. And in some cases, there's a trail uh, all of, of uh, Tim Hortons cups all the way back to the schools. Mm -hmm. So that is, I mean, I recognize you did the university. I just wondered about the high schools. Mm -hmm. Wasn't in the plan, but I think it's a good idea. Um, I think engaging the younger population is definitely uh, a broader area of focus for us. So yeah, we'd love to have some connections to some of those schools and see if we can bring in the education there. Um, as it relates to Tim Hortons, they probably won't be a participant in this pilot, um, but uh, we'll see if there's enough push. Maybe we yeah, can convince them. Enough. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And the other one is going to... Uh, and maybe this is for when it's uh, on the, later on in the agenda, but how does it work with the return bins? Like, are those at outside the restaurants? Are they outside FERD? And then yeah. who's taking all those containers and washing them and cleaning? Yeah, yeah so uh, there is a return bin at every single store. It would be inside the store. Um, customers can return their containers to those stores. So if you get a coffee from one cafe, you can return it to another cafe or another food restaurant. Um, and then we would look to try and increase the, uh, the convenience of those return bins, maybe by putting them in, you know, other locations, such as, again, apartment buildings, office buildings, transit stations, that kind of thing. In terms of the operations, um, the collection activity would happen by our team uh, or by a, part, a local partner organization where we would be collecting from those um, return bins and then washing them in a, in a central location locally. Um, but keep in mind that most of the return locations are at stores where they're able to clean themselves. So a lot of our activity actually becomes more of a balancing, a redistribution activity of, you know, the inventory. One location is a popular return location, but they don't need 50 containers to be returned to them every week. So um, that's kind of our, our activity to do. And we see a lot of parallels compared to like the bike share or the car sharing program where people can, you know, return the bikes to a certain area and they have to get redistributed back to places where people need them. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Siemens. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, trying to find all my things on the dashboard here. I just wondered if you could maybe articulate how uh, how this worked in Metro Vancouver and, and was there um, was there funding um, on, from the the regional district there and and just sort of your long term business plan is it to be um, fully sustainable, or what's the involvement long term um, once a pilot project is is completed? What what's sort of the next steps from your perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the our, our business model, just to understand, like how do we survive? <laughs> uh, it's we we buy we 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 buy the reusable assets. Uh, we invest in the infrastructure for you know for any like local cleaning, washing, redistribution, collection. And then we have invested in the technology to be able to track it. So um, what we what, what the, the challenge for us is when we go into a new community, it's the investment in the assets that we look to try and offset. That's where, you know, the, the longevity of the system can can last with that small investment from a community because these are, you know, again, durable materials that can last hundreds and hundreds of uses. So operationally, um, we are able to support the operations through the revenue that we generate from the, the local businesses that we're providing the service to. But really, when we look at like communities like Metro Vancouver or Fraser Valley Regional District or others that we're in communications with in other parts of Canada, it's about how can we co-invest co on the impact that we're going to have together as a community. And that comes in the form of uh, the assets that we would uh, need to use to circulate in, in, the, in the community. So um, as it relates to Metro Vancouver, we partnered with them uh, early on in our in our evolution, and they were very supportive in helping to connect us with certain businesses that would be open to this, um, and then look at you know how we could help them with reporting as well. 
and uh, there was some support for the reporting that we were able to provide and the impact uh, that we had in, in the various municipalities, um, such as you know, uh, the, the city of Vancouver, looking at North Vancouver as well. Um, so, uh, so I think you know, from what we're seeing, there's a lot of interest from municipalities across the country, and how do we actually bring this to our community? And we're trying to find a way to um, grow as quickly as we can and be able to partner with communities to, to co-invest on this and have the impact that I think we're both looking for. Okay. Uh, sure. Go ahead, That's Director Adamo. And then I think we're gonna move to the uh, chair. Forward. Thanks, just, just one more question. I may have missed it. So you're asked of the $20,000, what was the plan for that? The specific plan or the reasoning behind that? To buy, uh, to buy dishes was the the main okay. main reason, and then to circulate those dishes using our uh, our, our technology and our and our platform. Thanks, Director McAhonick. Yeah, I, I just had a question about your logistics about tracking, and we all know people collect bottles and things like that. They buy it; they can go get their money back if they choose to. But what about? if you're looking to expand and grow like not everyone's going to bring them back would there be built in an option so somebody that so it has a tracking device like somebody that is collecting things like that to like maybe seniors or, or people that want to do that would there be an option built in mm. so that people that aren't identified if they find things like that yeah. they can they they still can be returned and they can get some kind of credit or something credit yeah yeah, so um, they can be returned by by anyone. Uh, it's just that we're we're different than a deposit return scheme, where um, you know the deposit return systems like the 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 product is kind of trash ultimately. Like it can be found anywhere. You can get twenty five cents for it. We're we're not a deposit return system, so there's the asset has value, and we, um, we you know we're happy for anybody to re return it. But uh, in order to you know be participating in the system. I, you know, you ideally would be one who's borrowing and returning. So we don't expect, and we haven't really seen any um, examples of where these containers are kind of being left around and people see them and want to like return them for value. Um, it's it's more an example of, you know, people are borrowing and returning these these containers themselves or with their families uh, or with their friends. So, um, yeah, so the, the deposit return model would be a little bit, a little bit different where uh, I think that's probably the one that you were referring to. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions, nothing online. So uh, thank you, uh, Jason, for your presentation here. I know uh, we had this discussion at the City of Cholak as well. And um, uh, similarly to some of the food waste reduction programs that uh, that we've been in, involved with, um, I think it's, it's, it's positive in that, you know, you've got a community here that wants to uh, be a kind of an early adopter and and uh, kind of lead the way. And, and I hope other communities um, in the region will be able to benefit once we start to see some of the reporting come in and, and in terms of the, the waste reduction mm -hmm. um, uh, targets that we're able to achieve. So I uh, appreciate it. Also, as a... Um, as a frequent library user, I think the model is uh, is very interesting. Yeah, and like the comparison is apt because, you know, we you know we buy when we invest in libraries, we're we're investing in the collection mm -hmm. as well. So investing in books, and so it seems like uh, it seems like a good comparison. So mm -hmm. thank you for your presentation, and uh, we'll uh, you're welcome to stick around and, and wait for the uh, item as it comes up. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Ms. Kenneman. Next item. 5.1 is the draft regional and corporate services committee meeting minutes of March the 9th, 2023. Thank you. It's uh, moved by Director Popo, seconded by Director Johnson. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed if any, item carries. Next item. 6.1 is the British Columbia Social Procurement Initiative. There is a motion for consideration. Thank I you. move, Mr. Chairman. By Director Fascio, seconded by Director Smith. Discussion? Uh, Director Dixon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm kind of lacking some understanding around this whole process. And uh, so that's, I'm not even sure what my question are, but I guess if I'm reading this, it talks about um, a different kind of process where uh, social value and uh, for the community and things like that. So what's, what would that look like? And I guess another question is whose values are 
are making the decisions around the whole procurement. If you can figure out what my question is there. Uh, I can't, but lucky for you, I don't have to. The staff will have to. So um, uh, is that Ms. Kinnaman, Ms. Lounsborough? I know we did have a presentation to this committee um, on the BCSPI, and um, it was it was a, a bit of a while, it was a while ago. So maybe a bit of a refresher. Sure. Um, I think I'll turn things over to Ms. Lonsborough, who authored the report. Okay. Thank you, Director Dixon, through the chair. Um, thank you for the question. So there, there's two elements to your question. One is who defines the values. Um, they could be project by project values, and they could be values aligning with strategic goals. For example, environmental sustainability. Perhaps we're looking for a, a contract in a certain um, a certain field, a certain department at the FVRD, and, um, and commitment to environmental sustainability may be really important um, in 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 all of our efforts. So we would look to procure with with organizations that that value in environmental sustainability as as much as the FVRD. That's just an example, but. The, so that's the the value identification part. Part of the the participation in this BC social procurement initiative involves a board member on a steering committee as well as a senior staff member. So there'd be a lot more learning as we go and and input into those those types of values. And really, it does come down to what the FVRD values are and our strategic goals and our priorities, and then each individual procurement. Um, and I'll I'll speak to the the values and. Um, not the values, the, the real benefits for the FERD in this model. So at the FERD, we have a decentralized procurement um, model. We don't we don't have a procurement department. Um, if if one of our departments wants to go to RFP, they're on their own. We have templates um, and we have guides, and each each manager would go and go to the public. They put their bid on our website, they develop it themselves, or larger organizations have a, a department that that's all they do. You phone up your 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 pal in uh, procurement and saying, I need to get a contract. So uh, this, this initiative really um, has good templates and it really will help us. Our templates are a little dated, so this will really help us in that regard as well. Um, and offer the there's an offer of consulting time, there's um, peer groups, so we can really learn best practices and BC social procurement um, is, is offered amongst other local governments. So it, I think there's a real value in understanding um, the best practices in, in the field. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And if I <clears throat> recall, I think this uh, presentation came back um, uh, last year, sometime in April. And I know the presenters uh, at that time, it was the uh, mayor of, former mayor of Squamish. And um, there was a number of other board members participating, um, local governments across province. But one of the questions that came up quite a bit, and it uh, comes up, I know, around our table is how do you make or how is it possible to make procurement decisions that affect the local benefit, the local economy and the local employment opportunities, that kind of stuff. And so that's what I'm very interested in. I know we are bound by legislation to, um, you know, with those RFPs and when we tender things to um, ensure that we cast a pretty wide net. But I think with um, with some of the templates uh, that Ms. Lonsborough was talking about, they have different ways that you can um, work to to ensure that those values are being weighted um, appropriately. And, and I think that's something that I'm really interested in. I think, um, you know, that's certainly when I have the discussion across the province, that's this, the same kind of sentiments from, from my colleagues around. So, you know, why do we have, when we tender things, why are we obligated to, you know, have people in, in other uh, jurisdictions, uh, you know, come and work here when there's local providers that you could you could be working with. So um, hopefully we can learn some some uh, more information about that. Uh, Director Dickey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, maybe speaking from more of the electoral areas perspective, uh, much of what goes on in this organization uh, revolves around what the electoral areas uh, budgets um, feed into. And um, I think from a procurement perspective, I understand that we want good quality products at the lowest possible cost. When it starts to other um, variables start re feeding into the equation as to social and environmental outcomes, my concern would be 
how much added cost uh, starts to come into the picture. So I would hope that staff would keep that in mind. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Other comments? Director Horn? Well, following on Director Dickey's question, um, I know in the past we've been asked, not just at this table, but at uh, municipal levels to look at participating in bulk purchasing um, options. Is there an option for that here as well to partner with other communities that are in the social procurement game uh, and get the best of both worlds? Slonsboro? Um, through the chair to Director Horn, thank you for the question. Um, it's something we're really excited about. So in November, uh, when we came to the board, I believe it was November, with our enterprise uh, fleet management proposal, part of that was um, signing on to um, something called Canoe Procurement, and a lot of local governments are, are signing on with Canoe. So that's the other um, the other fork in the road, if you will, that allows bulk buying of, of equipment. For for example, could be um, lawnmowers or you know larger larger scale um, tractors. For example, um, so that type of thing is through our canoe procurement, and and that would really um, give us another another channel or another avenue to explore to really make sure. Um, and to Director Dickey's point, that we're really getting the best value for our money. And um, so what we'll be doing is launching these um, sequentially to the organization and and letting letting our our colleagues at the FERD know that there's choices. So we don't necessarily have to go through the, the, the same templates and process that we've always done. We have VC social procurement will be one avenue we can explore and use some of those templates wh where the need is, is appropriate and where it, where it fits. And, and if we need to do bulk buying of equipment or, or goods, then we can explore whether or not Canoe would offer a good choice. And that would be more efficient also for staff. It would bypass the, um, the procurement piece. Thank you. Other questions? No, and I'm glad you kind of underscored that a, a membership in this BCSBI doesn't obligate us to use it, right? So that's just, it's adding another tool to the toolkit and uh, similar to the other um, the other uh, tool that you explained, it doesn't obligate us to, or bind us to use these tools. Okay, uh, is there a question on this? Yes. Yeah. Second. We have a mover and a seconder. Too. We have a mover and a seconder. Thank you. I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? If any, the item carries. Next item. Six point two is the regional grant and aid policy. There is a motion for your consideration. Thank you. It's moved by Director Pablo, seconded by Director Prang. The discussion. Director Horn. Um, speaking with, I guess, a degree of concern about this recommendation. I'll start with questions, but I'll give a background on where the questions come from. I'm, I'm, I've been through a process where we went through um, grants and aid applications at the elected level and it became highly politicized, slowed down. And I've become even more concerned about it potentially here because I can't know Director Dixon's area or Director Dickey's area. And I really would have to trust their knowledge um, the question that's in the staff report is the essential one that I would want answered by either staff or an arm's length committee, which is the mechanism we look, use uh, in my home community. And that is, does this tick the boxes in terms of all of the requirements and particularly the idea that it's doing local good, uh, that it's leveraging local good in many cases. I have concerns that this is really just going to turn this into a uh, either highly politicized conversation or just a rubber stamping because everybody will want to make sure that they're nice on this grant aid because there's going to be another one from their area down the road. My question behind all of that is, have we looked at simply having an arm's length committee, whether at a community level or a staff level, simply to give us a cover sheet that says, these are the grants and aid applications that have met our criteria? Ms. Kinnaman. Uh, through the chair to Director Horn, uh, I'll take a stab at that and um, Ms. Lonsbro can, can chime in. Um, we have not at this point in time explored having a subcommittee specific for regional grants and aid. I think that the idea is that we're currently sitting in that subcommittee, which is the Regional and Corporate Services Committee, which would uh, review things uh, when they're brought forward at the close of the application time. 
Um, in terms of politicizing, I'm not entirely sure how we would get around that. I think that's always going to be an issue. However, um, one of the concerns that was expressed uh, early, last year uh, through the process was with respect to the regional nature of the applications. And so uh, staff certainly review the applications that come forward and make sure that they um, are complying with the criteria uh, and would be bringing forward recommendations based on the applications received. Um, historically, uh, we had a process that was perhaps even more politicized and less structured, uh, where uh, regional grants and aid were just offered out uh, ad hoc, uh, not particularly on an annual basis, uh, and um, a requester would come forward and the board would just choose to allocate a dollar amount to a particular organization. And so the goal with uh, formalizing this somewhat uh, was to ensure that there was more equity across the region, across all organizations, so that uh, everyone at least had an opportunity, whereas I don't know that that was necessarily the case in the past. Um, certainly, we're open to refining the process. Um, I think for 2023, what uh, the finance team is recommending since uh, the application window should be opening shortly uh, would be to simply, uh, for this year anyway, um, bring forward a, a process where you're not being asked as a board to make these decisions in the midst of the budget negotiations, but uh, try to uh, adjudicate them prior to budget. Uh, there could be situations where one applicant would come forward and request the entire $50,000 amount. And this board may decide that this is such an important um, event or organization or initiative uh, that you would want to put all of the eggs into that basket. Um, alternatively, there may be 10 applications and you won't be able to fund them all with the $50,000 that's allocated each year. So um, this is still relatively a new process, as I said. Uh, previously, there, there wasn't um, a particular process. It seems like uh, there was one organization that we are now funding through a different service area that had a direct connection to a service that we provide. And so that makes a lot of good sense. And that might be an option that staff would bring forward and the board might wanna consider uh, as, as a criteria refinement, uh, that there maybe has to be some kind of connection to the services that we're providing uh, that are um, offering a benefit of, of assistance so that we're, we're not able to do everything all the time, uh, but perhaps some of these community organizations that are able to augment an existing service uh, th that would be um, appropriate to give a grant in A2. So I hope that that sort of answers your question, but. Um, it, do it does, and I'll, I'll follow up, Mr. Chair. I forgot, nor did either that or didn't emphasize that when I talked about a subcommittee, I, I meant not a subcommittee of this board, but of an arm's length group of community members. That's oh. the approach that we've taken because then it becomes depoliticized I understand from your answer, Ms. Kinnaman, the need for us to deal with it sort of this year, which I will support for that excellent reasoning. But Mr. Chair, I'll look to you to perhaps come back after we've dealt with this matter. I think uh, a motion, I would like to bring forward a motion a separate from this that we ask staff to look at for the 2024 uh, budget cycle, some approach that gives us an arm's length way of looking at grants and aid applications. Okay, other questions on uh, regional grant and aid? Don't hear any, so call the question. All in favor, opposed to any, item carries. And uh, Director Horn. Thank you, I'd like to move that staff be asked to report back on options for grant and aid application oversight to be done at arm's length for the 2024 cycle. Thank you. Is there a seconder to that? Uh, a seconder by Director Fascio. Uh, discussion? Any further discussion on that, uh, Director Horn? Just quickly to summarize again, I, I think that uh, Ms. Kinnaman's scenario where we might have more applications than budget dollars is what I'm hoping we're thinking to the future about. And how do we provide for this board a clear set of criteria? hopefully depoliticized to the largest extent possible that would allow us to make those tough choices when that comes to pass. Um, the one, the one thing I would just say is I think I heard you say grant in aid. Uh, I 
assuming you meant a regional grant and aid, because right. we do have grant and aids um, administered by the each of the specific electoral area directors. And I'm not sure, but I believe that process is pretty much just as long as you didn't make that particular director angry, you uh, can, I'm just kidding. No, it's, uh, it's, it's they're usually involved. The, each specific electoral area director works with staff on the local grant and aid. So this is regional grant and aid, Thanks. not local electoral area grant and aids. Uh, we okay with that? Okay. Uh, any other comments, Director Adamo? Uh, through the chair to staff, and, and thank you, Director Horn, for that. One thing that perhaps can be added to that, and this may sound a little strange, but in an election year, is there a, a wording or phrasing that we can put into something where the incumbent would not be able to push through certain certain promises and things like that with relation to to those types of um, grants and aid requests? Uh, I'm not sure what the wording would be, but well, you kind of know what I'm asking. Yep. So through the chair to Director Adamo, um, well, specific to the electoral area grants and aid, we actually do have a a process where um, there are no grants and aid um, considered beyond a certain cutoff point prior to an election. I want to say July is the last uh, point in time where re electoral area grants and aid uh, can be considered at this table prior to an October election. Um, from the regional grants and aid, um, we can certainly look at how that that, would, that process would mirror um, an electoral area side. Um, thinking just sort of aloud off, off the top of my head, um, I believe that the cutoff deadline for the regional grants and aid is August of every year. And so um, you would not be considering this until the following budget year. So it may not be um is critical when it comes to the regional grants and aid because your october election you wouldn't have made decisions yet around uh those items but we will certainly add that for consideration when we come back uh, in the fall thank you other comments don't hear any so certainly i think staff are hearing that there's uh, um, a desire um at least by the, the directors at this table to um, look at further refinement on the regional grant and aid policy. I think that's great. Um, I think um, staff have done a great job in getting us to, uh, to a place thus far where we're starting to wrap some parameters around what used to be a pretty wide open uh, process. And so, um, yeah, I think further refine refinement probably um, probably necessary. And um, yeah, without having to find, figure out all of the those things on the fly here off the top of our heads, I think we would probably bring it back for another good discussion. I'd be supportive of that. Okay, I'll, I'll call the question. All in favor, oppose if any item carries. Next item. 7.1.1 is the Potential Clean Farms Agricultural Plastics Recycling Pilot Project. Uh, this is an item for information, but staff are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Question on this or comments? Don't see any. Oh, Director Adamo, go ahead. Co question representing um, Laidlaw, of course. How, how far out reaching did this program go or did this, your, your presentation go? How many farms were asked about this? How much research was actually done? I, think, gonna... I think we'll ask uh, our manager of environmental services, Lance Lilly, to comment on this one. Hey, good morning. Thank, Thank you for the question through the chair. Uh, the Right now, there's a pilot program in Agassiz that is dealing with with egg plastics in uh, within that community. What we're looking at doing would be potentially expanding that program out to cover the entire region, uh, including areas of Laidlaw and throughout Area B. Um, we have not engaged farmers yet in this activity. We're still having discussions with clean farms on what this process would look like. Dr. Pranger. Um, this is slightly more than a pilot project in Agassiz. Uh, we've been going, I believe, for 14 years. Um, it's a struggle in that volunteer, uh, a volunteer group keeps this going year after year after year. And they do divert a lot of plastics away from the landfill and recycling. Finding markets for the recyclables is a difficult situation, but Clean Farms has picked up 
there and and help through that process. So um, I, I'm supportive of following up and making sure that other communities also can remove agricultural plastics from the landfill. Great, uh, Director Castle. Thank you, Chair Lum, uh, through you. Uh, I'd like to know, that it, it is indicated in here that the program in Agassiz is voluntary. I'd just like to ensure that this pilot project will also be a voluntary program. Ms. Kinnaman. Uh, yes, that is correct. I see uh, Lance nodding his head as well. So yes, it is intended to be a voluntary program. Other questions? Uh, Director Dixon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just, I, I really like this idea. I see plastic, like all of you, probably blowing all over the place sometimes, and um, it's from the farms, and um, fair enough. But where's the ALC in all of this? Like, are they part of, you know, uh, you know, you know, requesting or at least being in the initiative around um, uh, not using plastic or finding different ways to dispose of them, or are they just left up to volunteer organization like Clean Farm? My, I suspect maybe um, this falls out even of their jurisdiction in terms of things being covered with right to farm or agricultural farm practices, but um, Ms. Uh, Director Pranger looks like she's got her hand up. <laughs> Um, no, Being they're, a former ALC person. they're not involved, but this did go forward as a resolution to UBCM. So um, we have asked the province to step in and, and make it uh, a, a more wide ranging project, but that so far has not happened. Thank you. Other uh, questions, comments? Don't uh, see any. Next item. 7.1.2 is the reusable food packaging pilot project. There is a motion for your consideration. Move okay. recommendation, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Fasio, second by Director Popple. Discussion. Uh, Director Horn, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you. Generally speaking, supportive of this type of initiative, but I just wanted to ask about um, Section 271 through 274 of the Local Government Act. I note that it carefully identifies that this would be a partnership in some form, thereby sort of not engaging the rule around assisting a business. Um, but I don't see in it a significant amount of detail on how that partnership will realize in something that is a hard return for the regional district. I clearly see that it may have alignment with our environmental manage or our solid waste management plan, but Partnerships suggest to me there's some hard return, whether we own a share of the infrastructure we're helping to purchase, the, the dishes, the containers, whether there's a future dividend. I think that we're talking about a for-profit enterprise, and it's interesting hearing Director Pranger talk about a volunteer organization that's doing work that will have similar impacts. I want to make sure we're aligned with the LGA and also that we aren't um, forgetting that down the road we... Um, we, we may uh, want to make sure that there is some, if we're, if we're an investor in this, as opposed to simply uh, a partner in, a, in providing in-kind um, uh, services, I would like to hopefully see that there's some way we can show back to the taxpayer that there's some potential return on investment. Uh, that's not a question I necessarily would expect staff to be able to answer today, but perhaps when we're at the regular board meeting, we could come with some thought around that. I'll support it today, but just wanted to ask about that. Okay, is that flagged? Um, I know the city of Tilak who stands to um, to match funding on this um, in a partner. I, I think we've had a our staff have had a pretty good long look at that as well. So, but good good thing to get some information on our board. Um, Director Siemens, got a question? Uh, yes, thank you. I, I... I concur with the, the comments from Director Horn. And my concern is that we would be seen to be benefiting a private company. And, and uh, I know at the city of Abbotsford, we've had some, uh, some fairly robust discussions uh, when similar types of requests have come forward. And I, like, I really like the idea. I think the idea has a, a, a tremendous merit and um, I love the private sector leading the way. I just a little concerned that um, we're not 
going down a path that, that might be um, suspect and what type of precedent does that set um, for, for future, um, you know, for us to give seed money to, uh, to an idea. Um, I just wanna make sure that if we do go down that path that we go down with our, wide, our eyes wide open and, and address the issues that um, the director um, Orrin just brought up. And so I'd just be interested to, to have that discussion, I guess, at the board table. So um, I like the initiative. It, it is not against what the idea is. I just, it's about the process and, and just making sure that we have our I's dotted and our T's crossed. Thank you. Other uh, comments, Director Dixon, go ahead. Just clarification. Um, I know the city of Tilbrook has been asked to provide matching funds. Did you say that they have agreed to that? We have. Uh, other comments, questions? Uh, I don't see any. Call the question. All in favor? Opposed to Penny? Item carries. Excited. 7.2.1 is the 2023 Regional Growth Strategy Monitoring Report. Again, an information item, but I know that there are staff here that would love to discuss it. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, Dr. Fascio. Just a thank you again to staff, um, Mr. Chairman, through you. Very good report, very useful. Uh, we're stepping down a little bit with our OCP and going back to uh, more information from the public at large and another public hearing. And when I read this uh, information on here, it covers so many areas that's so important. And I really appreciate the work that was done by staff, thank you very much. Great, thank you, uh, Director Fascio. Uh, Director Damo. Uh, yes, uh, through the chair to staff, thanks very much for this. I thought it was tremendously informative. Informing, yeah. And I asked for a copy of it. There was so much to go through for uh, for the newcomers. There was a lot of great information in there, so it was terrific. And I look forward to going through it a little bit more and having some questions to follow up with that. Thank you again. Thank you. Other question, directly, uh, Siemens. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the work on this, and I think it aligns very nicely with what the, the city of Abbotsford has been working on with our official community plan. Um, and so looking forward to uh, to being able to use this um, for advocacy. Uh, I know the with uh, especially with transportation and uh, a few other challenges we have with uh, with employment plans and and you know even some of the discussions with the the plastics that um that agassi is working on i think that there's a, a lot of synergies that we can use um, to have that voice um more numbers to the voices on on some of these issues so i look forward to the, the path forward and appreciate the work thank you other comments or questions don't hear any uh, my my director kenneman did you, or, or miss kenneman did you have a yeah Actually, kind of, oh. <laughs> you got a demotion. I got a demotion Sorry. today. Sorry. <laughs> wow. Uh, I saw your light on. You had no comments on that. Nope. Perfect. That was an information item. Item. Uh, moving down to reports by directors. Thank you. And I know we have a report from Director Siemens. I'll just check in. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, so with the, the transit strike, uh, I think it's causing a lot of indigestion for all of us, um, especially our, our seniors, students, um, you know, young families. I know even at the city, um, at the hospital, the, the parking issue um, has been directly correlated to the transit strike. So there's a, a lot of challenges. And I know that we have to be careful because in compliance with the labor code, we don't wanna necessarily be seen as getting involved in um, influencing negotiations between BC Transit. Uh, but this is largely a, an issue that um, is, is between um, First Transit um, and their employees and their union. So I, I think that there's, um, there's an opportunity for us at the regional district um, in talking with the uh, Minister of Labor, sending a, a letter um, to engage with, a, engage a uh, mediator at the appropriate time. 
And uh, I think if we're sending a letter from the regional district from the, uh, for, on behalf of the Fraser Valley Express, I know the city of Abbotsford um, is preparing to do the same. I think we're gonna be discussing that on Monday. So I think a letter coming from the city of Abbotsford that, and, uh, and, and the city of Mission on the central Fraser Valley um, if we could have a corresponding one similar to, um, to our letter coming from the regional district on behalf of the Fraser Valley Express. And then I think um, recommending, hopefully Chilliwack uh, agrees and sends one on behalf of the city of Chilliwack. Uh, so talking with our staff, we felt that that might be the best approach at this point as to engage with the Minister of Labor to, um, you know, that we're very concerned this is affecting um, a lot of working families, a lot of students. Um, yeah, and you know, our seniors, um, even our, our um, handy dart does not, uh, people that are, are wheelchair bound that require handy dart to, to even buy their groceries or, or you know, even go to, to appointments that aren't critical, um, they're not doing that at this point. And so it's causing a lot of hardship in, on a number of people. And so I, I think there's, you know, we don't want to get involved with the, the labor negotiations, but we also need to let the, the provincial government know that we're very concerned and it's affecting some of our most vulnerable um, um, citizens. So I would like to make a motion that we send a letter um, that we that we consider sending a letter on behalf of the Fraser Valley Regional District in regards to um, to this issue and that we coordinate that with the city of Abbotsford and the city of Chilliwack. Yep, very good. Is there a, a seconder uh, to um, Director Siemens' uh, motion? Seconded by Director Popo. Further discussion on this, Director Horn. Thank you. I think it's, um, it's an important thing for us to let the labor negotiation process evolve uh, but like Director Siemens, I'm concerned that there's essentially sounding like there's not a lot of conversation going on right now. Recent news reports suggest there may be an escalation of things like court injunction, injunctions, um, getting that information just from the newspaper. So I don't know how much validity there is to it, but at my observation in uh, negotiations like this, there's really only a few ways they can go which is an extended period of time, which hurts all of the riders. And ridership is an incredibly challenging goal right now coming out of COVID, uh, as well as hurting um, the operators as well. And the other option is that uh, ultimately it goes on without a middle step and there's some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, legislated settlement. To me, asking for a mediator is a good middle ground. It allows everybody to come to the table and maintain their positions and get help through them. But it also, from a community perspective, gives some sense of accountability that actual communication is going on. So um, I think that it's a, a, a good approach. I'll simply add that I think the letter should be CC'd to local MLAs across the region, as well as to BC Transit. Very good. Other comments or uh, questions on the motion? Um, certainly speak in favor. Um, I know in uh, having discussions with uh, our colleagues in the Sea to Sky who um, experienced a prolonged uh, disruption of uh, service um, well, last year, I think. Uh, the, I think the clock uh, on that one was about 120 plus days or so before um, the province appointed a mediator to the to that situation, and then I think um, they found a resolution a couple of weeks later. So um, certainly, from my perspective, agree um, with uh, the sentiments um, shared by uh, uh, Director Siemens, and Director Horn, um, and also <clears throat> appreciate that. Uh, this is a this is a labor dispute and negotiation that uh, we are not involved in in any way, uh, but uh, we do have a role to play in terms of uh, advocating to the province. And I think you're quite right. The minister of labor is the person who has the authority, has the, the ministerial power and authority to uh, appoint a mediator to the situation. So, certainly speak in in favor, Director Siemens. You have your hand up again. 
Yes, yeah, and, and I think, you know, the frustration that we have is, um, in the Central Fraser Valley Transit um, with Mission uh, is we had uh, one of the highest uptakes since COVID on, on when it returned. Um, you know, we got a lot of momentum. We've been building our transit system um, from the core out, really getting a lot of buy-in. We, but we have a lot of recent immigrants. Abbotsford is a charter community when it comes to uh, receiving immigrants from uh, Afghanistan and, and, um, and Syria. And we're also, you know, so a lot of those folks uh, to get to their language skills, to get to their, their jobs, um, this is all affects lifestyle affordability, which now they're having to take money out of their rent um, or they're missing uh, appointments or they're missing shifts at work. And it just, you know, sort of escalates. And so, you know, the challenge that we have when we're, we're building um, a transit system in an in a urban area that hasn't really, you know, had a cohesive plan. We put that plan together and, and we had tremendous uptake. And, uh, and if we lose people to, to their, you know, other forms of transportation or get them into cars, we're not going to get them back into the system. And it needs to be, um, you know, they need to get their head into the game here that there's a lot more at stake than just this labor negotiation. We've got the long-term viability of our transit system. So just getting very frustrated on this end that, uh, you know, you, you do all your due diligence and then uh, you get kicked in the shins and you're, you know, get knocked back a number of squares. So anyways, just my thoughts and thank you for letting me bet. Thank you, Derek. Stevens, certainly feel your, feel your pain. Um, we're 130% of pre-COVID numbers on a number of our, uh, um, our uh, systems in the Chilliwack and also the FBX. And um, yeah, we don't want to see that take, uh, you know, get affected uh, by this. So uh, we're ready for the question. All in favor, oppose if any item carries. Uh, any other reports from board? Director Horn, go ahead. Thank you. Um, had the opportunity along with Director Lum, Director uh, Pranger and Dir Director Ross to attend the uh, housing summit last uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, I sat between Director Pranger and Director Ross, uh, the championship plowers, which was good because there was a lot of material to plow through in the, over that two days. I want to point out that Director Lum failed to bring the word plowing into his panel discussion despite the wager we placed with him. Uh, in all seriousness, though, um, obviously an incredibly serious subject and one uh, at the end of the two days that there were probably more questions raised than answered. Um, and I know that in each of our communities, including the regional district as a whole, there have been many thoughts about um, approaches to deal with uh, the housing crisis. So um, I, I'm going to ask staff to identify this as something that goes on the agenda of the uh, upcoming uh, mayors and chairs agenda. And I'd like to ask the mayors and the chair of the RD to, to come really with a sense of a summary of what's happening in your local communities and the questions we might express to the uh, provincial minister of housing coming out of this announcement. As I said, um, there were a number of uh, implications around pre-zoning uh, density of four to six units on single family lots, pre-zoning all secondary suites, um, the removal of some public processes. And I'm sure uh, if we act nimbly, we can ask some of the right questions as a cohort. So, uh, and I'll also remind folks that that meeting is coming up. If there are other items they'd like to add to the agenda, please let us know. Other reports from directors? Yeah. yeah. Uh, don't. Hello. Oh, sorry, Director uh, McAhonick. Sorry, can see your light. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, just on the on the housing thing locally, um, our stakeholders group dealing with rural homelessness in the Chilliwack River Valley and um, and uh, abandoned camps is. Uh, been meeting now since January, and uh, I think we have a really good representation of local authorities, and we're actually seeing some pretty good movement. And uh, I was able to talk to Chair Lum after the meeting briefly. Um, but um, I, I think it's just uh, we have a really diverse group of stakeholders with authorities, and we're able to do the, you know, the Ministry of Transport 
forestry, um, all of, you know, conservation, NRO, um, DFO, all of that part of thing. But we also have BC housing. We also have local um, organizations. We have um, somebody that comes that is able uh, very quickly to come and accompany somebody from outreach and sign them up and, and get them expedited to get uh, social assistance. So it's a little bit, it's a different approach, but I think that uh, we really got something that that's going to be really working and a good model. And I'm really hopeful that we can use that model because I don't think anybody's doing anything like this. And I think, you know, the RCMP, everybody that's at that table is really invested. So that's my report out on that. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Director McHonick. Uh, Director Smith. Hi, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I just want to know and uh, hope we're, on, we're doing April 22nd, we're doing Earth Day, which is celebrated in over seven countries of the world. This will be the third one we've done. Uh, we've, we've, in one day, we collect an amazing amount. So when you start seeing paint and stuff that's been business, been out, they have been out of business for 20 years, you know, the people are concerned about doing it properly, not dumping it down our drains. Uh, last year, we collected 1,200 tires one day which is was a crazy amount uh also we do glasses and that the alliance club they sit, sit, uh, ship overseas to other countries to help them out we do cell phones uh, and we just uh we just try to make a little difference in that so one day makes a uh, very big difference in that we're also doing a separate day with the chihuahua band to clean up cars on the reserve and that to try and help them work with them so i uh, just trying to make a little difference in our little corner of the world thank you thank you director smith director Fascio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick report regarding Earth, uh, <clears throat> Earth Day. Next uh, Wednesday, the 19th, the uh, Harrison Elementary School. I've asked them to participate in the cleanup of the uh, of the village. Uh, so some hundred, over 100 students and their teachers will be doing a, a round cleanup. And then they're going to be treated to lunch at the resort hotel. So um, looking forward to the... Uh, participation uh, next Wednesday. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Director Fascio. Okay, now I see no more lights on. Uh, Ms. Kinnaman, next item. Moving down to public question period for items relevant to the agenda. Uh, we don't currently have anyone attending in person in our boardroom, but we'll just turn things over to our corporate officer, Jamie Van Ness. Ms. Van Ness. Thank you. Uh, so it appears we have one member of the public joining us by Zoom today. So this would be your opportunity to ask a question relevant to the agenda. If you would just hit the raise hand function, if you do have a question. And it would appear that there are no questions from our member of the public. Q, next item. Looking for a resolution to close the meeting. Q, let's move by Director Mr. Second by Director Pranger. All in favor, opposed to any item carries. Okay, close. if you just give us a few minutes to get the room ready. 